The Beatles, also known as the White Album. Whatever you think, you have to agree on one thing. The White Album is a snapshot of a troublesome ear and of a delicate time for the biggest rock and roll band in the world. Could this possibly be the Beatles album which induced the most varied cultural responses? Was it the seed for the Beatles breaking up? Whose fault it was? Let's find out in this episode of... If Music Could Talk Okay, remember the feedback. Try to be less explosive, more serene. 1968. The mood had changed since the previous year's Summer of Love. Throughout the year, several social movements reached the boiling point all over the world. The civil rights movement in the USA, the protests against the Vietnam War, the rise of the women's liberation movement across several countries. No, sorry, this is not me, it's not working. Fine then. It was a hell of a year. Divisive, violent, controversial, the turning point of the boomer's life. The Beatles had started 1968 well. Sgt. Peppers sat at the top of the UK charts until February 1968. The Magical Mystery Tour film fiasco was mitigated by the rave reviews for its soundtrack. Thanks to transcendental meditation, the Beatles had given up drugs. The death of manager Brian Epstein in August 1967 had hit them hard. But now, in February 1968, they felt they could finally travel to India. Time to rejoin Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and study meditation. It was a wonderful, peaceful time. Once in Rishikesh, the Beatles were free to be themselves for the first time in years. No media, no obligations, no fans. With other VIPs and meditation students, they enjoyed the nature, meditated, wrote dozens of songs, tried to grapple with personal problems and started breaking up. Wait, what? It turns out that something was boiling under the surface of the Beatles, too. Paul McCartney was a bit mean with George Harrison at times. He also took it upon himself to act like the motivator, or dare I say it, the would-be leader of the Fabs. Paul's talking about the next album annoyed George to no end. We're not f***ing here to do the next album, we are here to meditate. John Lennon was grappling with his inner demons, his dissatisfaction with his life and his marriage with Cynthia. Like George, he was all for embracing meditation. John did it with the same passion he displayed for rock and roll, fame, money, free love and LSD, only to be disappointed by it all. Not everyone in the band shared that enthusiasm. After a couple of weeks from their arrival, Ringo Starr and his wife Maureen returned to London. Ringo hated the food because of his health problems. Maureen hated the Indian countryside because of her insect phobia. Both missed their children. Another two weeks and Paul left with his girlfriend, Jane Asher. Paul liked the meditation and all that, but Jane couldn't care less. And besides, there was Apple Core to put together, and surely one could meditate at home? George and John didn't take the departures too well. George thought Paul had missed the point. John, who had come to India thinking that he might not go back to his previous life, felt betrayed. Enter John's close friend Alexis Mardas. Mardas arrived after Paul had left. He noticed how skilled the Maharishi was with finance. He didn't fail to stress how the holy guy was using the Beatles to gain recognition and money. And then Mardas spread rumors about the Maharishi sex escapades with some of the meditation pupils. There was no proof, but it didn't matter. The gossip poisoned John's admiration for the yogi. John left on the 12th of April. 
George didn't believe the accusations, but he had already decided to take part in a Ravi Shankar documentary, so he left too. I'll spare you the stories about Lennon and Harrison, believing that the Maharishi had put a curse on them, or those of them being asked to leave because they were taking acid to meditate better. It suffices to say that by the end of May, the Beatles had reconvened at George Harrison's home in Surrey. With some 30 songs ready, it was time to forget the ill-fated Indian trip. It was time to get back to Abbey Road and find that old, glorious band Alchemy. Could they? Not quite. Hello Topatters, this is Simon Mas, a guy who's so anxious to get through you, he can't calm down. The White Album showed how much the Fabs could still offer. It was rough and gentle, folk and experimental, bluesy and classical. One thing this album wasn't, though, was plain sailing. In 1967, the Beatles were a four-headed monster, four people speaking as one soul. By the time they entered Abbey Road on the 30th of May 1968, things had changed. The decision to stop touring, the death of Brian Epstein, the difficult shooting of Magical Mystery Tour, the stress of starting their corporation and working on the business side of things, the growing personal differences, perhaps the drugs too, all seemed to create divisions within the band. There had been hints of what was to come. India, as we said. The fact that John and Paul decided to present Apple Core to the press alone. Then came Yoko Ono. She and Lennon had become lovers on the 19th of May. John decided to divorce Cynthia to be with the Japanese artist. This did create problems for the Beatles. For a start, John wanted Yoko to be on his side all the time. The studio sessions had been a private retreat for the Fabs. The no-guest policy applied to wives and girlfriends too, and it was rarely waived. But now, John kept bringing this woman with him. To be fair, it was a real annoyance. The line of communication between John and the other Beatles was now interrupted. John turned to Yoko more readily than he listened to his bandmates. In turn, he misinterpreted the coolness around Yoko as downright racism and sexism. But it wasn't necessarily so. Imagine. One day you got John, who had liked blondes who looked like Brigitte Bardot for all of his life. The next, John shows up with this diminutive, unappealing, black-haired, opinionated, older-than-him Japanese woman. It must have been like that time he walked into the first Apple board meeting, stoned out of his mind, announcing that he was Jesus Christ reborn. It must have been a face, right? The tone of the discussions within the band were also different now. Take the one on Revolution. Lennon wanted it to be the next single. The Fabs needed to make a statement about what was happening around the world. Harrison and McCartney were dead against it. The idea broke the policy of not talking about politics in the band's music. Even worse, the song was too slow. And it ended with a big avant-garde collage, hardly something that could peak on the charts. Lennon thought his bandmates didn't get it. But he reworked the song, making it faster and more aggressive. The old revolution ended up on the album split in Revolution 1 and 9. Then there was Paul McCartney. He had always been a bit of a perfectionist, but now he was being a pain. He wanted to have a say on everything, and he was turning nasty. After wanting one re-recording too many of his vocal part on Obladi Oblada, producer and friend George Martin tried to give him a suggestion. He was shouted at. Martin shouted back in frustration, but Paul had his way. If you know anything about Martin, you'll find the episode extraordinary. 
On the 16th of July, engineer Jeff Emmerich walked out in the middle of a session, never to return. He had enough of the constant bickering. On the 22nd of August, it was Ringo Starr who walked out. You know, things are dire when even the universally pleasant and gregarious Ringo walks out on you. Paul didn't like George's songs. He also found some of John's too harsh and needlessly provocative. John called Paul's Obladi Oblada granny music shit. Everyone hated the piece, but McCartney insisted on recording take after take of it. While Ringo was pondering whether he really wanted to leave the Beatles for good, things calmed down a bit. Or rather, everyone found a way to work around the others. Paul got to record by himself. The others deserted the studio when there was no need for their presence. Only 16 tracks out of the 30 gracing the White Album had all the four Beatles performing on them. Throughout the years, I noticed one thing about People and the White Album. Everyone sees whatever he wants in it. Some people love it, some people hate it, some people think it's really interesting, some people think it's a bit random. As usual, I'll let you do your own listening. Here, I want to point out some ideas that might serve as food for thought. The White Album as we know it is the result of a 24 hour long mixing session. Literally, during that time, John Paul, George Martin and engineer Ken Scott performed a wonderful magic trick. The listener has the illusion that the album follows a musical journey, that the songs progress logically, if not smoothly, from one musical landscape to the next. If you consider how varied the recorded material is, that's quite a feat. The richness and the variety of the music also help keeping you on the edge during the first listening. Because, let's face it, a few songs are not that great, and a couple are utter shit. Most critics claim that the White Album is one of the first postmodern LPs. What does that mean? Postmodernism is a way of producing art. It plays with meaning and randomness self-consciously using styles and conventions to create a dialogue between different genres. Postmodern artists have little patience for formal rules and for a single, monolithic authorial voice. I think this doesn't apply to the White Album at all, and not just because I despise postmodernist theory. Think about your blues. This is John Lennon playing with the blues conventions, right? Wrong. He might be playing, but he's also hammering out a tongue-in-cheek song that is totally John. It's about his love for Yoko. It's about his rediscovery of rock's raw power. He's not trying to make you think about the blues conventions. He's bending those conventions to make a personal, authorial statement about his life. Think about the message the fabs convey in the album. Love, nature, peace, truthfulness and positive change should be the end goals of our life, crystal clear and delivered in a plain way, right? Any parody is reserved for policemen, gun lovers and chocolate eaters, not for the serious business. Even Honey Pie continues the long tradition of Paul's fixation for dance hall homages. But hey, what do I know? I might be wrong. How about you tell me what you think about the matter with a nice comment? The White Album, officially known as The Beatles, came out on the 22nd of November 1968. Its predecessor, Sgt. Pepper's, received praises from everyone. The White Album, instead, was less universally loved. The establishment seemed to take a harsher attitude towards the Fab Four, 
The London Drug Squad raided John Lennon's and George Harrison's properties, something utterly unthinkable only a few months before. The Beatles were, after all, members of the British Empire. In the United States, conservatives couldn't forgive Lennon for his bigger-than-Jesus remarks. They started accusing the Beatles of having issued an album that would brainwash the American youth to pave the way to communism. As usual, they were right. It actually happened with the election of Richard Nixon. Ah, oh. But the album was also criticized by elements of the left. It was outdated, fearful, sedated, escapist, and all of that jazz. The Beatles were ignoring the fighting in the streets, the world outside their golden bubble. The Beatles were rich. The Beatles were irrelevant. The Beatles were the enemy. Another trend was people going crazy over the hidden messages of the White Album lyrics. Everyone is familiar with Charles Manson. It's reading of the coming of the apocalypse in the lyrics of several White Album songs, especially Helter Skelter. But everyone and their dog seem engaged in a similar sport. It didn't help that the Beatles themselves had put oblique references to real events in their lives and to their previous work in, say, Glass Onion. Everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey, Julia, Savoy Truffle, and so on. For good or bad, the White Album reflected the world in which it was created. But this time, this came with a hefty price tag for the band. The pressure from the outside and the inside, the Beatles, had been too much. They had stretched their muscles to the limit. The four were at their boiling point. In hindsight, a period of rest was obviously needed to mend wounds and egos. But after just 40 days, the Beatles were back at work. Not only were they tired and spent, but they had to deal with even more pressure than usual. Something was bound to break. And it did. But that's a story better left for another time. Let's see what other listening options you have. Beggar's Banquet, the Rolling Stones' 1968 album which was the darling of the new left. After that, why not choosing something completely different? How about checking out albums from bands hailed as the new Beatles throughout the following decades? The Bee Gees. After all, they performed Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in the 1978 film with the same name. I've watched it. You better not. But you might like the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack, heavily featuring the band. The Knack. The Knack? Yes, according to the usual infinite wisdom of Rolling Stone magazine, the band was to be the new Fab Four. Check out their Get the Knack. Do Run the Run. Have a listen to their 1993 self titled album, also known as The Wedding Album. I have created a podcast about the Beatles' history, which is full to the brim with facts and curiosities. It's called What A Fab Day, and it's free! The link is in the description. Having said that, it's time to go. Stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye bye! I've always loved the White Album. Granted, there's at least a couple of songs that I barely tolerate. But there are so many great ideas. I recall listening to it on a tape in my car with my friend Gigetto when I was in my early 20s. At the time, it became another golden standard of what a band could achieve. If not every member is on the same page, you can still strike gold. Great music can happen if you give people the space they need. That's something that I still forget sometimes, so there. I will hang this reminder over my wall. While creating What A Fab Day instead, I came to appreciate another lesson. 
This period in a Beatles career shows what happens when you flex your muscles too much and too often. You can give 110%, but you can also destroy the nicest thing you have. And you? What's your story with the Beatles? What do you see in it? I am looking forward to read it in your comments. Simon Mas, music you love.